We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Give people time to finish joining. All right. Welcome everyone to the tools team meeting for May. Uh, keep in mind that this session is being recorded and the recording will be posted to YouTube. We are um, well, several Several weeks have gone by since our last meeting because we skipped the meeting after IETF 116, so we have a lot to cover. Does anybody have any bashes to the agenda that they've not already added to the uh, the notes page? And everybody has the notes page in front of them, yes? Not hearing any bashes. Um, first item that I've got is to congratulate Jennifer for joining the LLC as a senior developer. So, yay. Um, we have Paul Selkirk. He is um, sharing video. Yeah, just waved his hands. He's joining us from Painless Security. Um, has already landed a PR. It's been merged into Maine. Should be part of this week's release. So, well on our way. Good start. So we had a tools team retreat at the end of April, um, right before the beginning of May. We met in Montreal. Um, we had Lars for one day of it. We spent quite a bit of time uh, talking about how we we're going to prepare for the change in the IT infrastructure, um, how we were handling our basic deployments, um, the interaction with the CDN, how we're going to be doing releases going forward, automating um, our releases into a you know cloud, uh, an infrastructure that assumes that we're deploying into into cloud services, um, and then you can read the rest of the bullet list. If you've got any questions about the things that we went into, let me know. Um, one note at the end is that we do know we've got a few. Um, strategy paths that we're um, going to start pursuing and we're going to write those up and put them out for community feedback over the next few weeks. So far I haven't heard anybody say anything. I'm assuming audio was working for me, but if you said something and I haven't heard it, please um, raise, raise an issue. Anybody have any questions about the tools? For yeah, thank you. We've started making fairly rapid progress on the move of DNS into Cloudflare and the revision of DNSSEC to use a more modern signing algorithm. You can uh, Track the link that's in the notes to the card on the roadmap that shows where we are. We've finished IRTF.org. We are going to start uh, with RSCEditor.org later today. Um, IETF.org will go last. 
be either later this week or next week unless we run into trouble. We also have a large number of domains that we're holding because we don't want someone else to use them, but they're not really um, doing anything at the most. They're doing a redirect. Um, most of them are just doing nothing. Um, those are in the process of, of being moved. Um, we had expected to have them done before this call, but have been running into some impedance with that registrar. Um, but I think we're working through it. Uh, this has been quite an eye-opening experience for me with just how difficult it can be to deal with the, uh, um, as they call it, losing registrar when you're changing the registrar for a domain. And in particular, some of the registrars that we've been using are um, not the same companies that they were when we initially started using them. Anybody have any questions about our changes to DNS? All right, the next item that we've got to report on and possibly discuss, um, we have our meeting wikis spread out across several technologies. Some of them had been in track, um, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, track's been turned off. Um, the uh, we do have the flat HTML that we created, and we have the meeting wiki part of the um, flat archive that we made for those meeting wikis that were in track. We also have several meeting wikis that were in DocuWiki, um, sitting under www.ietf.org/registration, and then modern meeting wikis are in um, wiki.js. We already have some RFCs that have linked into meeting wikis. The RFC that talks about um, running hackathons in particular has many links into um, these older meeting wikis. We've been discussing whether or not to continue to try to hold on to these things as not wiki artifacts, but something unrolled that could be attached to the proceedings, or if we should just move to not preserving them ourselves, but using archive its service as the archive. And I think that is the path that we have um, landed on as an operational recommendation so that we're not um, continuing to carry separate bits. We just make sure that the wiki themselves got wrapped up into archive it at some point, and we just drop our versions of the wikis at the um, point that the meetings are finalized. Anybody have any comments, concerns? Okay. Uh, um, do you want to uh, say it? Go ahead, on. Alexis. Um, I do want to say uh, web archiving is an awesome idea. I think that is great. We should do it regardless. Um, it can be a very finicky kind of process to make sure you actually got every single URL. So it's not a it's not a tiny undertaking, but. Um, we, we just need to make sure at least the when we do it that we are very, very thorough. So I think you're going to want to give like a month or two of leeway <laughs> to make sure that we got through everything because the, the the crawls can run for like a week at a time. And then you need to do like QA, make sure you've got everything, figure it out, go run another crawl, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to give you a heads up that that is a, a relatively uh, ponderous process. Sure. All right, John, do you want to speak a little bit to this item that we've got on our current DMART failure for aliases? Uh, sure. Um, as, I'm, as I'm sure you've all noticed, um, when mail gets sent to ITF aliases, um, it frequently disappears, particularly if you're at Gmail. Um, and this turns out to be because people send, people's organizations have 
published DMARC policies. It's a P equals reject, which is very, which is very, very secure, <clears throat> and which means that any mail that's received from them has to have a valid DMARC signature or come from an authorized IP address. And <clears throat> it turns out that when mail goes through our our forwarder, um, the headers get reformatted just enough to break the DMARC signatures. And since it's coming from our from our forwarder rather than from the original source, it doesn't come from the authorized source, so the DMARC fails and the mail disappears. So <clears throat> It seemed kind of like why was it reorganizing the the why was it reformatting the headers? So I, I took a look in the code, which is ancient and messy, and the problem is essentially that it uses a, a mime parsing library to parse the entire message, and then it deparses it on the way out. And the mime library thoughtfully reformats the headers to make them look nice. Um, and so it would not be super hard to kind of patch around that. And in fact. It does that in a couple of places. There's one place where it does DMARC rewrites and it actually specifically checks to say, oh, if I didn't do any rewrite, just use the original text. Um, and I could pretty much go, and it wouldn't be super hard to go back and patch around the places where it does it. In other places, it would be not totally trivial because sometimes it adds some headers you need to part, you, you need to splice it into the string. But I'm reluctant to do it just because the module is such a piece of garbage. It's got Two thirds, of the, two, two thirds of the module are copies of random, random libraries that duplicate stuff that's now in the standard Python library, and there's places where like it reads its own, it reads, it reads its own source code to look for, look for the string arguments to put in the help text. So kind of depending on how long it's it's, it's going to take before we want to re redo it. I mean, if it, if it's going to be a year, it's probably worth fixing. If it's only going to be a month or two, I would rather push to rewrite the whole thing in Python 3 because it's going to end up a quarter of the size and more functional. Oh yeah, and there's the final thing I put in the in the in the in the notes, which is even if we fix the DMARC problem, there are a significant number of people who only authorize only authenticate with SPF, which means that even even if we even if we did nothing whatsoever and passed through the literal bits, the DMARC would still fail. So we still need to do some sort of hack similar to what we do for rewriting the addresses on um, mailing lists, which yeah. is ugly, but I don't have any way around it. John, just to be clear, is it for the aliases like a draft.all or something like that? Not for the mailing list, right? Uh, sorry, it's, it's hard to hear you. Yeah, sorry. The issue is only when you are using aliases like draft blah 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 dot all. Yeah. Well, if it doesn't go through, no, it's it has the same. Our mailing lists have the same issue, but we have a but we we, but we slapped the band aid on the on the mailing list that rewrites the from line. So mm -hmm. this is yeah this is this is, this is yeah. The answer to your question is yes. This is when it, when it goes through, you know, to draft blah blah or to the various role accounts. You know, it, it's mailing to the i to the. Uh, to, 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 to yeah. Thank you. So the rewrite that John's talking about is to Python three is going to come with Mailman three. Right now, the the library that um, we're talking about is necessarily um, Python two point seven because it integrates with Mailman T quite closely, which is a Python two seven package. Um, I actually have a way to work around that. I, I, I basically, like, it, it would be possible just to write a little stub that just, just, uh, just use enough type that just called enough Python two seven because all it's all it's all it's doing with Mailman is pulling out the names of the mailing lists. So, right. so we okay, if we wanted no. to, we could hack it. But again, uh, is it worth it? Yeah. So the Mailman three transition is. Um, expected to be later this year. Um, you can see where we have it on our roadmap, but there is um, uncertainty around how we're going to approach it that is expected to resolve with the RFP process that we're about to go through. Um, we want to understand what our um, bidders to the RFPs are proposing for um, management before we have a really good feel for the timing of what we're going to do with these modules. 
So um, I think, John, you and I should continue to talk. It might be worth doing a smallish fix. Um, I don't know that a that it would make sense to do a lot of work that's not going to be reused when we get to Mailman 3. The thing that you hinted at, that if we just leave 2.7 and write the Python 3 version of the, um, of the full um, post-confirm daemon, um, but just leave it where it has um, the integration to the current versions of the connections into post confirm, I mean, sorry, into post fix and the current connections and just wrapping the current connections into mailman. Um, we might, it, it might be worth pursuing, but let's, let's continue that conversation offline and see if we can scope how big that effort might be. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, the fix is maybe a, is maybe a day to do more or less. So yeah, we can figure out whether it's worth it. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions? Things they want to discuss? People want to volunteer to jump in and write help rewrite the code. Okay. Kasara, we've got a um, IAB website transition effort in progress. The uh, one of the things that we've been working on is extracting the uh, um, artifacts that are currently in WordPress and in the Word in in the primary website um, reflecting. IAB minutes and IAB statements in the primary website. We've got ISG statements. Um, we're going to be moving these into the data tracker. We have had um, several discussions over the last week about what the modeling for that is going to be. The, it's pretty well understood what the modeling for the minutes are going to be and what the modeling for the statements are going to be. Um, one of the sets of artifacts that are out there are appeals. Um, we're having a discussion about how we're going to model appeals going forward as they have a different structure from other just document types in that there's a uh, appeal response and further correspondence relationship that we need to make sure that's um, natural to um, work with as as we go forward so um there's also quite a bit of work that's been taking place on modifying our um set of wrappers our extensions if you would to wagtail to support um, moving the IAB website onto um, a Wagtail instance that's very similar to our www.ietf.org Wagtail instance. Kassar, do you want to talk for just a little bit about um, the activity that's been going and the testing that's been going on there? So um, Spring Lord is working on the uh, development for moving vector, uh, moving IAB to vector website. Uh, we are going to use a multi-site feature in vector for vector to do this. So code base is going to be a single code base for both IETF, .org and IAB. But we will be hosting those two in uh, two different instances uh, because we, think, we figured that, for example, in searching documents, there can be a spillover from IETF website to the IAB, so it's better to have two different instances. Most of the work is done, and there's some. Uh, bugs that needs to be fixed. So 
So we are probably be looking at another couple of weeks to get this into production. Uh, we have a meeting today with Spring Lord uh, to talk about the uh, remaining issues. Awesome. You may have any questions, comments, Gregor, um, Cindy, is there anything that we left out? No, just thank you guys for all of the work on this. All right, Jay, do you want to talk about the uh, trust initiated tools changes? Okay, audio in place, great. Um, so um, <clears throat> uh, as explained, um, uh, the trust have explained to me their concerns about content licensing for wikis and con uh, contribution attribution for wiki changes proposed on GitHub. Um, the, uh, I'm reading this out loud, but I'm assuming many of you haven't read it. The initial view of the trust was that some of our current practices could no longer conti could continue. And so I propose some possible technical solutions to them, which they accept and which I've um, right, um, started the process of discussing with the community. So the first one, the one I've already um, um, raised with the community is um, content attri attribution or contribution attribution, I should say, for wikis. Um, uh, their concern is that contributions made by GitHub to the wikis are not sufficiently attributable to fulfill the requirements of the note well. And their initial view was that um, we should not allow people to edit the wiki via GitHub. Um, I have suggested instead that we have a mechanism whereby um, we can, as the um, uh, maintainers of the wikis, um, see whether you know have an automated process that tells us if that github user is somehow registered in data tracker and um do the um uh, choose whether or not to accept it that way that's um acceptable to the trust but when we've been when i've raised that on the list for discussion people have started arguing about the basic premise of whether or not a um, github um uh a contribution is um, sufficiently attributable or, or not to meet the requirements of the note well. And in that specific case, I'm only the messenger. So I'm hoping that the, the, the direct conversations with the trust will take place and that the trust will respond to those on, on list about that. Um, the other one which I haven't yet raised on the list um, is about content licensing for wikis. Um, they are concerned that we can't have a blanket CC BY um, 4.0 license across the wikis because the wikis contain things that are contributions and need to be licensed um, under the TLP, the, the trust legal provisions. Um, for example, excerpts from RSCs and other things. Um, now, the initial view of the trust was that any such content should not be permitted, but we've actually had that content there for many, many years. Um, on the uh, wikis. We've just never been particularly clear about what the licensing of the wikis was. Um, and so um, I propose that instead we build a macro for the wiki that can be used to flag content under a different licensing scheme. So we apply one blanket licensing scheme to the wiki, whether that's TLP or CCBY is to be decided. And then anything that's an exception to be that is flagged as under that exception. Um, and uh, I haven't yet raised that on the list for discussion at all. So that's where we are about those. If anyone has any particular thoughts or views of those, please let me know. If anyone disagrees with some of the premises, then we need to um, somehow um, have the, the trust engaged on that um, about those things. Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll continue on that on the list and um, uh, the next one we'll just see where that goes. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. All right, we're through the section that I anticipated we would have discussion time on. Um, a really quick summary of what's in the FYIs. If we have a spot where we need to stop and discuss, just um, speak up. The uh, RFPs for the change to the IT infrastructure are being prepared now. We have a lot of um, 
mechanism that we are building for our interaction with Cloudflare. One of these are um, we are building tools to better manage our access rules, the lists of IPs that we always allow to access our sites, those that we have blocked because of abuse. Um, as the uh, UI at Cloudflare for doing these operations leaves a lot to be desired. Um, we significantly changed the way IMAP interacts with the data tracker credential base. Um, we haven't received any complaints over the way that that change um, went. So um, for us, it's really good because the IMAP server is not using a fork of the data tracker code anymore, using a copy of the data tracker code. Um, we have that uh, uh, tight coupling dependency um, now separated into a proper API. We spent a lot of time at 116 working with the RPC, um, primarily Gene, Alice, Sandy, and I met um, for several hours working through the uh, first set of things that we're going to be doing on the RPC um, tooling refresh, uh, specifically on the tool around managing the, um, the RPC workflow. Um, we've got uh, a lot of user stories have come out of that and the beginnings of design and we're now into starting to um, go back and forth on the uh, uh, what the interaction with the data tracker is going to look like in detail is just starting to get into wireframing um, this is the, the meat of this and the implementation part of that's going to come behind the Django 4 um, upgrade process after we've got Django 4 de deployed because the what we're going to build is very definitely going to be um, based on the Vuevite framework and that we really want to have Django 4 underneath us before we start into that. The roadmap has been up for several weeks. We've got feedback that it is useful. We added quite a bit of content to it while we were at the tools retreat. Please review it if you see anything at any time that is confusing, missing. Um, uh, raise the point on IETF Discuss or directly with us and we'll, we'll make sure that the roadmap is giving the community a clear view of what we're actually um, working towards. We finished the data tracker um, Postgres migration. We had a hiccup with the um, timestamps that required uh, uh, pretty intricate hoop jump to fix, but we got through that. Um, we're watching performance with the instrumentation that we've got. We're not seeing that overall performance is significantly different, but performance for pages that people were particularly sensitive to um, have anecdotally improved. Um, we're suspecting that much of that observed, people observed improvement is in parts of the stack that our current tools aren't instrumenting. So we're looking at um, changing the our instrumentation to see further up the stack so that we can see what's happening um, with performance there. We'll be talking to um, Sirius Open Source later this week to schedule the next step in uh, managing our Postgres instances. The next task is turning on replication between the Postgres instances at ITFA and ITFC. Right now, our um, failover strategy is that we would take one of the daily dumps um, and restore, but that would mean that if we had to fail over, we would lose a chunk of a day. We'll have re um, replication set up over the next several days, and then we will we'll evaluate whether or not there is a significant performance impact for having that replication running. We're not expecting there to be one, but we'll be monitoring that closely. And I'll send in a report once we have that data. So before 
the ITF 117, everything will be replicated, right? We'll get a standby in July. Yeah, I'm expecting right. that we'll have that before um, the end of next week. Okay, thank you. So. We had a period of time, um, the beginning of May, where our asynchronous container processing draft submissions lost the ability to send email. This was an unexpected um, change in the behavior of Docker on our primary server. Docker Compose brought the network for the containers up on a network that was not what had previously been advertised as the set of networks Docker would, you know, the, the addresses that Docker would come up with with networks. So it was outside of the firewall allows on IETFA to um, let the let the Docker reach out to the out, even to the in to the mail server. Uh, once we discovered it, um, the fix was fairly quick. We reached out to every um, draft submitter whose submission was affected, and we know for certain that their submissions are complete. So we don't, we've not left anyone hanging. And we're still discussing what we can do while we are still on um, IETFA to be more resilient to changes like that should Docker decide to start using a different network segment than what we are currently prepared for them to use, then um, we get automatically react instead of having people reporting brokenness before we move on it. I'm reading some of these things in a bit more detail than I intended to. I really intended these FYIs to be things that we would skim through quickly, so I'm going to up level. Um, we've turned track off. We've got some issues with the way that the redirects are working because of the way pages got moved, but we'll get through that. It's just um, lifting that needs to be done. Um, we had a effort a while back to choose a font set of font families to use consistently across our sites. We've landed on that. We're expecting the next release of the data tracker to use them. Um, the other web properties will start using them as the, we hit um, the next release in each of their uh, uh, development cycles. We've um, started using static.ietf.org for um, facilitating static content delivery. Um, the next release of the data tracker will be using that for um, fonts in particular. Um, and very soon after that, we will be using it for the artifacts that we have that are um, always unchanging. So the internet drafts, the um, document types that we have where once they're out there, they don't change, they, they'll be um, served from this site. Okay, development projects, the data tracker has seen a bunch of releases. We've talked about some of the things that went by already. We're in the process of the Django 4 transition. We've made it all the way up to Django 3.2. There's a link to our development test server that has the Django branch running on it. Please spend some time poking around there and help us find things that are broken. The diff crawls are currently not finding any differences between the sites, but those don't exercise forms. So those of you that are used to doing secretariat things or ISG things, please take some time, go poke around on that site and make sure it behaves the way you expect it behaves. Um, so far, the kinds of trouble that we've been running into as we've been migrating, I have um, been of the form that 
dependencies. Um, changed significantly as Django moved from two into three and into four, or we're just flat abandoned. And as we're moving through these things, we are moving on to more modern versions of the dependencies and dealing with the changes in the interface to those dependencies as we're, as we're going along. The changes to core Django itself have been pretty state forward to deal with. Um, and that part of this process is going fairly quickly. Jennifer, is there anything else that you want to particularly highlight? Uh, no, I think that covered it. Oh, yeah. So um, what we're planning to do in the short term now is to finish this migration into Django 4 to continue to move these artifacts that we discussed earlier into the data tracker. We have a couple of long outstanding problems that we're going to dive into shortly after that. We have to repair our reference relationships because the um, submission tool was building them on submission from the XML without expanding the um, includes. So anything that was in the repository in XML with a pronoun and XI include to a reference did not actually get captured as a reference in the related document sense in the data tracker. Um, we've got a workaround for that until we get to the um, point in the data tracker where we only accept fully expanded documents. Um, that's on the roadmap, but not as soon as repairing these reference relationships. And we're also going to regenerate all of BibXML3 using modern author extraction tools, um, dealing a little bit with some of the questions about initials. Um, I had hoped to wait to do this until we had uh, agreement in the community and the change at the um, um, RPC to where we just used author names as blobs instead of paying attention to this first initial last name. But that's still looking like it's going to take significant time. So we're going to move ahead and make the references less broken than they are now. Uh, we've got a wave of changes we need to make to support NomCom, a wave that we need to support the meeting scheduling, then of course a wave to support um, the meeting itself. Those will be the remaining focus in, in the very short term. And then, as I mentioned, getting into um, fully expanded drafts and then the work to support the RPC um, tool refresh. Kasara, do you want to um, walk us through the BibXML author tools, XML RC, and the Whitetail website part? Okay. On BibXML service, um, there are a few main bugs that one particular bug that needs to get fixed. Uh, they have the reverse has fixed that uh, upstream, so we need to get that into the BBXML service. Um, I will be going through the open issues for BBXML service and realize um, um, with the reverse to get the um, main ones fixed. Any uh, questions about BibXML service? Um, so I want to other tools. Um, since the last call, the uh, main uh, major development of auth tools is to um, add a way to uh, compare documents uh, without converting them into um, text. So uh, RxCD can be used to compare uh, 
XML files or markdown files uh, without converting them. Um, and uh, another change was um, the document comparison on author tools uses uh, RFCD by default. Uh, there's a uh, work on the way to switch between RSVDIP and IDD, but I guess most people would be more comfortable with RFCD. Um, any questions about other tools? Um, on next on next to RFC. There were two major releases. Um, the, particularly the 3.17.1 uh, seems to be breaking things. Some people seem to have issues with the installing uh, the new version uh, because it's changed the way uh, setup files works to future proof uh, XML to RFC. Uh, if the one way, the easy way to fix that is uh, just upgrading the PIP tool on your system uh, that should fix most of those issues. As for upcoming work, um, I am uh, uh, compiling a, a GitHub repository with all the fonts that uh, XMTRC uses. Uh, Right now, uh, the instructions are to use uh, not a fonts, not not a fonts from uh, Google, and the uh, repository that uh, the the link to the uh, not fonts that we provide on Excel to RFC is uh, outdated. Uh, it's not uh, maintained anymore. So, um, in the future, this font repository would be the font repository to go and get all the fonts required for. Excellent RFC. Anyone have any questions about Excellent RFC? Um, on Vectel website, I think we touched, uh, we talked about the uh, migration to IAB. Uh, Apart from that, a um, um, couple of other features that would be in the next release are uh, type tables, which um, allows you to like add tables with images and other content and uh, uh, we will have a widget that gets the not file from the IETF uh, GitHub repository and uh, show it whenever uh, that widget is used. So idea behind that is the not fail would be in one place uh, and uh, rest of the services will just use that not well. Any questions about that? That's, that's it from me. All right, Ryan or Eric, do you want to add anything to what's in the notes about Mail Archiver Yang Catalog? So we've had a long running um, project that was um, cycle starved because we were focusing on off PD on, at the yeah. IMAP server. Uh, where we can allow mapping from one username to another to support people who have changed their primary login at the data tracker and move to the point where somebody can use any of the um, email addresses that the data tracker knows them by as their username when they log in. This doesn't mesh well with the um, core implementation of user at the IMAP server. So Alexi and Ryan and I have been um, working towards um, 
an ability to configure things in the middle so that a username can be mapped into another username inside IMAPD. So a data tracker username could be mapped into a different IMAP the username. The first uh, attempts at making this go didn't um, succeed, but we're about to pick it up and, and make another run at it. That brings us to um, open discussion and any other business. Does anybody have anything else that they would like to talk about? So I missed the first part of the call, but I don't know whether you said it, Robert. Uh, there will be, you will have two IEZ liaisons from now on, as Warren Kumari uh, should be my twins. Yep. I and mean, Warren wasn't able to make the call today, or did we not just not give him? I was expecting warning. him. Uh, no, I'm not sure whether he got the right information, right? So no, he has the right information for sure. Yeah. You know, we can make sure he's in. Um, Mallory Noodle is also um, joining us as the IAB liaison and I think is on the call today. So I'm glad that we're getting um, all of the um, all the help and the, the good communication with the, the people that are using the tooling the most. If no one has anything else, we'll let you get back to your day. Thank you again for the time um, you take helping us um, steer the way that um, the tool development is going. And we'll see you um, online between now and the next call.